It is a forgotten part of the earth, a wild expanse of desert at the end of the inhabited world. These are the sands of South Africa, along the border with Namibia, a harsh landscape of shimmering heat. Here, the dunes are marked only by the occasional blossom, tiny specks of bloom on a barren horizon, bleak and empty as far as the eye can see. That's the first impression, but there's a surprise. Every inch of this desolate ground is enclosed and guarded behind barbed wire. For this godforsaken desert is home to the most sought after stones in the world. Diamonds, the largest and loveliest ever found. From the star of South Africa to the massive Cullinan, fiery gems that would become legends. Over 1,000 miles, the Orange River meanders through the burnt landscape of South Africa, a river of wilderness carving through the desert. It is the country's longest waterway, bringing life to the arid soil of the Northern Cape province. Along its banks, the stony landscape is transformed into green farmland. But the currents of the Orange River transport more than just water and silt. Here, too, there is untold wealth. Rugged, sparkling crystals borne slowly, mile by mile, to the coast. The mouth of the Orange River is the site of the most adventurous diamond prospecting of our time. There, where the pale green merges into the deep blue-gray of the sea, the treasure hunters are waiting. All along the restless coast of the South Atlantic, hundreds of small boats are anchored. On board, the divers are preparing. The diamond hunt is about to begin. Starting point is Port Noloth, just below the mouth of the river. There, the small, self-employed boat owners congregate. Further out, 25 miles off the coast, the De Beers fleet mines the rich alluvial deposits at depths inaccessible to human divers. This is a high-tech enterprise computers and robotics handling the underwater work. Along the coast, however, man is still the treasure hunter, risking his life in the quest for diamonds. Jewels beneath the waves. It sounds so improbable, yet it can be explained scientifically, according to Peter Schroeder, diving manager in Port Noloth. Over the last 28 million years, as the rivers flowed from inland to the coast, they eroded the top layer of rock which contained all the old kimberlite pipes which contained diamonds. And as they eroded these, the diamonds were conveyed and traveled by the rivers down into the sea and were then distributed along the coast. The Atlantic is the last stage of the gemstone's journey. The story of the South African diamond started not here at the mouth of the river, but hundreds of miles inland at Kimberley. This is where the diamond rush began. Kimberley is the town which was built around a hole, the big hole, the most famous diamond mine in the world. Today, it is filled with water, 
But when the first gems were discovered here back in 1871, men began pouring in, up to 30,000, pumping, digging, hunting for diamonds. They created a huge labyrinth of sorts, the architecture of greed. Thousands of black migrant workers provided the gigantic labor force for the mining, which became more and more dangerous as it delved ever further into the depths. Cecil John Rhodes, entrepreneur and later South African prime minister, named his company, founded in 1881, after the Boer brothers who had once owned the land where the big hole was discovered, De Beers. By the end of the decade, he had a virtual monopoly, the foundation for what would become the world's largest diamond company. The Kimberley era was the golden age of the diggers' rush. In the shadow of Cecil Rhodes, others too became rich. Joint stock companies were founded, concessions granted, shares distributed. With the diamond, there developed a new economy. The town grew around the hole. First to come were the barkeepers. In the saloons and taverns, there gathered a motley crew of shady characters, scoundrels and swindlers, speculators and disreputable diamond dealers the twilight world of diamond fever. Then, everyday life took shape. Banks and shops opened up. The town lived off diamonds. In 1914, at the beginning of the First World War, the mine finally closed. In 43 years, enough diamonds had been mined to fill three trucks. And Kimberley was left with a hole 500 feet deep. Like every diamond mine, the big hole is a so-called pipe, a volcanic shaft. Some 100 million years ago, volcanic eruptions caused kimberlite to shoot through these pipes up to the Earth's surface, contained within the hardest substance known to man, diamonds, pure crystallized carbon. In the land all along the Orange River, there are many rocks containing kimberlite, but unless one discovers a pipe the mining of just a few carats may require blasting tons of rock. But there is another simpler way to follow the trail of diamonds, for it leads inevitably to the water. Just beyond Kimberley, the Val flows into the Orange River and it carries gems. In the course of time, wind and water erode the volcanic hills of the pipes, and sooner or later, dirt and gravel debris are all washed down to the rivers. Wide and heavy, the torrents of water gush through the rugged mountains. The river is shallow here, and the diamonds drift along with the current, downstream towards the Atlantic. And so, the Orange River is in fact a path of gemstones tucked away among the boulders. This is the source of the river's great appeal, for at any moment one might find a diamond. But one may also spend decades and come up empty. Now and again on the banks of the river, we meet small-time prospectors. They work their concessions for a few square yards well apart from the diamond industry. Here, time seems to stand still. For 10 years, under the blazing sun, one of them has been digging a hole. Not the big hole, but a mine all the same. A tiny one, which shows just how much faith and perseverance the diamond seeker needs. For coast patients, every day brings the same drudgery. The chirping of crickets, the hammering of stones. Each stone from the mine is smashed onto a sieve and then washed very carefully. If the decisive stone is overlooked, then weeks of work will be in vain. Slowly, the mill wheel turns, crushing the stones. 
The process of diamond extraction is not so different here in the mine of Coast Patients as in the industrialized plants of the big companies, but it is much, much more arduous. Coast Patients turns the wheel again and again. He washes the stones and then examines them patiently. He lacks machines, but he has time. Kos has not yet found any first quality diamonds, but he has come up with enough to survive. He can pay two or three workers and feed his family. Dirk Potgieter, who has known Kos for years, explains the prospector's philosophy to us. And there are three sieves. We've got the big sieve with the big stone, which can play, turn these diggers into instant millionaires. Then you have the second sieve about this size, and these stones, well, that will keep them going from the one month to the other month. And then the third sieve, the one that's smaller than this one, it's about this size. Now that will pay them overage from the one month to the other month and keep the diggers going. Coast Patience is true to his name. He continues to hope and believe in his good fortune in finds like the shimmering diamond among the dark stones. But so much along the Orange River depends on luck, which is why so many strange legends and superstitions were born there over the years. Legends like the Grotslang, the great snake of the Orange River, said to be 40 feet long with diamonds for eyes it is thought to guard a great cache of gemstones. All those who travel the river must fear its wrath. Since the earliest days of diamond hunting, another legend has persisted. In the jagged mountains beneath the river's Ograbis Falls, there is believed to be a diamond crater. It is said that the jewels move slowly down a pipe to the riverbed year after year. Perhaps this is only a legend, but possibly in the ravine beneath the waterfall, a great accumulation of diamonds has gathered, flung down by the thundering currents. No one can tell. The risk is too great. The pounding waters would injure or kill anyone who dared to find out. But the tantalizing prospect remains. All along the river, we come across traces of diamond history. The first great South African stones were discovered nearby, the Eureka and the famed Star of South Africa. Even the bridges are named for De Beers executives. Ernest Oppenheimer was the successor to Cecil Rhodes. And so, as the waters run down to the sea, we return to the starting point of our journey, the mouth of the Orange River where the diamonds are waiting. For the diamond hunters, a new morning brings hope and danger. The biggest danger in the operation is when the divers undermine rocks. In the efforts to get the gravel from the deepest places under the rocks, um, we've had two divers killed. Hazards come in many forms for the divers. The weather can be fickle and cruel. Out on the sea, it changes in a matter of minutes. This, the wave rider reading here, controls a lot of the town because the moment this shows that it is a diving day, which is normally when the second figure gets to 13 or less, yes, um, divers 